Welcome to Module 7 in our CS179 Networking 1 class. I'm your instructor, Robert McMillan. And we are in Chapter 14 of the Managing and Troubleshooting Networks book by Mike Myers from McGraw-Hill. And this one is Remote Connectivity. So here's what's going to be covered. Switch networks, POTS, which uh, may not stand for what you think it does, Sonnet, Cable, DSL, Satellite, CellWAN, Fiber, and BPL. All acronyms you're going to need for various different quizzes. So you're going to need to know what those are, what they mean. Circuit switch services, something we've been talking about in a lot of different of uh, the uh, these modules. It's the oldest and simplest WAN approach. It uses public switched telephone networks, or PSTN, uh, or basically just the telephone, provided by common carriers. Uh, basic types in use today are POTS, which is plain old telephone service, via the use of modems to dial up and connect to the ISP. So there's still 5% of the people out there that still use modems. And it may be because they're too far away to get any kind of uh, decent broadband, or it could be just too expensive for them. Uh, there's also ISDN, which is Integrated Services Digital Network. And it uses it's a circuit switch service, and we will get more into that a little bit later in the module. So the basic architecture of circuit switched services. This is how it works. So you've got your cloud here. You've got common carrier network. That could be any particular one, such as AOL, and there's lots of other ones still out there. Uh, so it's a very simple design. What happens inside of the network is hidden from the user. So the user just dials in and connects. They don't really know what's happening. Uh, a computer using a modem dials the number and, uh, of another computer and creates a temporary circuit. When the session is completed, the circuit is disconnected. So it doesn't just have to go to an ISP. You could dial into a server. Uh, so a lot of companies had servers that um, uh, they would have banks of modems connected to them. And so when their staff would go to other locations, they would dial in using a modem on their laptop uh, computer directly into the server. And that's how they would communicate. So POTS-based circuit switch services use regular dial-up phone lines and a modem. And the uh, modem right now is uh, the fastest one is 56K. They pretty much stopped at that one uh, with the V92 series. So once the connection is made, the data transfer begins, and it's used to connect to the Internet by calling an ISP's access point. Don't confuse that with the wireless access point. That's something different. <clears throat> so the ISP, or the, I'm sorry, the ISDN-based uh, circuit switch services combines voice, video, and data over the same digital circuit. So now you can uh, get actual video and voice as well, uh, and it, it actually sounds and looks okay. Not great, but okay. Uh, it's called narrowband ISDN because it's the speed isn't that great. Uh, provides digital dial-up lines, uh, requires an ISDN modem, so not just a regular modem, it requires a special ISDN modem. Uh, it's called uh, a terminal adapter, an ISDN network terminator is needed, and each NT needs a unique service profile identifier, SPID. Not a lot of people have signed up for uh, ISDN, but uh, it is one of those types of services that will be around for a long time because it has the ability to travel over great distances, just like phone lines. Because really what it is, it's just two phone lines tied together uh, in one connection. And uh, that's it's always on, though, unlike uh, POTS, which you have to use to dial up and, and disconnect when you're done. ISDN can be on all the time. So dedicated uh, circuit services, we're going to change gears just a little bit. Um, is the equipment that's needed for a dedicated connection, which we're going to talk about the different types here in a second, uh, is a CSU-DSU, which is the Channel Service Unit Data Service Unit. I've configured many of these over the years, although not as much lately because they typically come pre-configured now for you, whereas as, uh, before they were a separate device that had to be connected. Uh, a WAN equivalent of a NIC in a LAN is basically what that is. It may also use multiplexers. And again, multiplexers was another device we used to have to configure that was separate. And now it's also built into a lot of the devices, so you no longer have to do that. T carrier services. This is the most commonly used dedicated digital circuit uh, in our country. 
uh, units of the T hierarchy, which uh, you will see uh, in a little bit. So you've got DS0, which is just a single phone line. A single phone line is 56K, but he also uses 8K of overhead. So that's how you end up with 64. So the basic unit of a T1 is 24 of these DS0s tied together. So you have uh, 24, um, uh, T, 24 phone lines tied together. It makes a T1, which is 1.5 megabits per second. So the 24 basically times 56. And again, the 8K is uh, used for overhead. A T2, which is really not common at all, but I've, I've seen a few, few of them, uh, takes four T1 circuits together, and you end up with about 6 megabits per second. A T3, which really starts to get expensive, because now you're wrapping a lot of phone lines together, uh, is uh, 28 T1 capacity, so you're looking at about 45 megabits per second. And the T4 is going to be uh, even faster at 274 megabits per second. So the expense, of course, is very high on that, but the good news is it will travel over great, great distances. If you don't have the money for a full T1, you can go with a fractional T1. A fractional T1 uses a portion of the T1. You might use, uh, say, six DS0s or eight DS0s or whatever it is that you, you can get 12 for a half T1, whatever it is that you can afford, and then it's uh, you know, brought out to your home or business. And that's not in use as much as it used to be because it's just so slow. So this is the hierarchy of the different T sizes. Um, you've got the DS0, which would be an FT1, that's 64 kilobits. Uh, you've got the T1, which is also called a DS1. That's just a different designation you know, for it. And that's one and a half megabits, T2, DS2, et cetera, et cetera. So it's basically what we just talked about, except for now you can see it all in one table. So a comparison of services, you've got circuit switch uh, services such as POTS and ISDN, and uh, here's your speeds. So you can get up to 56K on a POTS and 128K for the minimum ISDN size, all the way up to 1.5 megabits. And here's your costs, and your network integration is difficult. I wouldn't call POTS uh, difficult, except if you, know, if you don't have the right equipment, it might be difficult to configure it. But if you have all plug-and-play equipment, it's, it's not too bad. ISTN is definitely difficult to configure, not something that um, is, is easy for, for a novice to set up. Dedicated circuit services, you have the T carrier, that's the T1s, etc. And that uh, can go from 64, because you could do one single uh, DS0 to get a 64K connection, all the way up to 274 megabits. Cost is uh, moderate, and the network integration is also moderate. It's not too difficult to set up a T1. Definitely it does require a professional, but uh, usually somebody with not a huge amount of experience can, can set these up. Sonnet, we're going to get into Sonnet in, in the next slide or two here, and that is for super fast connectivity. So 50 megabits up to 10 gigabits, and, and of course the expense is going to be very high. And the network integration is similar to one of the T systems. So you can also use uh, some of these other uh, types of connections. Some are more popular than others. Uh, ATM, which is anywhere from 52 to 10 gigabits. Uh, this is basically using the same kind of connections that the T carrier uses, except for it uses a different protocol to make it work together. Uh, frame Relay, that also can use a T carrier type connection, uh, but it uses either a public or a private connection. So instead of using VPN uh, to connect your offices together, you could have the ISP connect them all for you using a frame relay. Now, if we jump down to MPLS, it's the same thing as, as the uh, frame relay is, except for it also uh, allows for additional flexibility and greater speed. So frame relay and MPLS are very similar technologies. Uh, Ethernet is one of the more newer ones, even though you might think Ethernet has, has been around forever. It's, it's not the same type of Ethernet that you use in your network. Um, this, this type of connection is typically called Ethernet over copper or EOC. You can do Ethernet over other ones as well. And it's not your internal network. This actually comes from the ISP itself. So for instance, EOC it typically comes in 10 megabits, uh, synchronous connections, 20 megabit, 30 megabit, that kind of thing. But uh, that, that's the uh, average speeds. But you can go up to 40 gigabits per second. Just something I wouldn't normally see. Uh, 
And it is simple to connect, just plugs right into a router and on one end and on the other end, you connect your uh, network uh, connection and you're good to go. We jump down to VPN. Uh, this one is great because it's so incredibly fle flexible. So it says 56 to 40 gigabits, and it's not provided by the internet service provider. What you do is you go to the internet service provider and you get them to connect any one of these other types of technologies, and then you tie them together using your firewall. So your firewall uh, matches the firewall settings on the other side, the, at the other location, and it allows you to set up a virtual private network. So you're virtually all in the same location, which is very nice. Um, so speed is not a factor. It'll it'll use whatever the slowest speed is, uh, whatever the weakest link is. That'll be the uh, speed that you get, and between uh, two points. But if you you could also connect multiple points together, multiple offices can all be VPN. Now you can do it in a hub and spoke kind of a thing where uh, it's a star pattern where everybody connects back to the main office, or you could do it as a mesh. So all of the uh, uh, offices can connect to all the other offices separately. Separately. So that allows for high availability. Sonnet is a uh, specific type of hierarchy that has designations just like the T carriers do, but they're much faster. So you have an OC1, you have an OC3, there's also an SDH designation, which you don't need to worry about. It's just another uh, organizing type of body that uh, uses a different terminology, but it's the same thing. So OC3 is the same as STM1, and it'll connect at 155 megabits per second. So this would be something, um, especially when you get into the gigabits, that you may not see in the average business. You might see them more in university campuses or government installations. So let's now uh, change gears to more what you ha might have in your home or in a small business, and that might be cable. So of course there's Comcast, CenturyTel, lots of different cable companies where uh, they provide data over cable internet sp uh, spec, which is called DOCSIS. Some people call it DOCIS, it's, it doesn't really matter. <clears throat> Basically the uh, cable companies come out with a coax cable, and they run their Ethernet signals or their, their, data, their digital signals over the coax, and it goes into the back of the modem, and out of the modem comes uh, Ethernet using a CAT5 or CAT6 type of cable that then goes into your switch. DSL, DSL, instead of using a cable, it actually uses your phone lines. So the same phone line you may have used traditionally to talk on the phone uh, uses a filter, a special DSL filter, and it goes into your standard phone jack, which is those little small RJ11 connectors with the very thin cable. That, that goes in one end from the ISP, and on the other end, it comes out with Ethernet, so a CAT5X or CAT6, whatever, using an RJ45 connection, which is the standard connection used for the um, cat uh, 5 cables and uh, so this is you know this this came out far uh, way before cable came out and uh, it was one of the first affordable for homes and small businesses type of broadband always on type connections uh, my first um, broadband connection was a DSL and I believe I paid um, about three hundred dollars a month for just a hundred and twenty eight kilobits so and I was happy to have it because it was so much better than uh, than dial-up was of course that was uh, around the year 2000 now now we can get in the megabits uh, for you know 20 to 100 megabits for around $100 through the cable company. So most DSL lines um, have gone away, but there's still you know some out there, and here's why. So you've got synchronous DSL. Uh, which is the uh, you have the same speed upload and download so that way you have uh, you know you can, if you have a, a, a five megabit upload then you'll also have a five megabit download so it would be very good for hosting things like websites and email uh, ADSL for asynchronous DSL so you have a much faster download speed so you're pulling the data much faster than you could upload so it's not really suitable for any kind of uh, hosting of any websites because the upload speed is usually a tenth of the download speed, but great for surfing the web and it's very inexpensive. Uh, VDSL, which is very new, it can get up, to, get up to 100 megabits, which is about 10 to 20 times faster than what most DSLs can do, and uh, you know ADSL and SDSL. Uh, it's a newer technology. It's not widely deployed. We're not sure if it's even going to make it because most people are are cutting their their uh, 
their phone connections and their copper connections. So it, it may not even be worth it except for in certain areas where that hasn't happened yet. IDSL is great for rural areas. It's very slow, but you can have it very far away from the CO, which is where the connection, connection office is. Uh, so this will travel for tens of thousands of feet, uh, whereas uh, SDSL and ADSL cannot go that far. They have to have a CO that's much closer to them. Cell WAN, this is a great technology for a backup internet connection. It's cheap. Uh, you basically take a USB dongle, and on one end you have a uh, connection to a cell tower, and on the other end, end you connect into a computer, which you can then share uh, for Ethernet, and then uh, people can all get out the internet through that cell. Nothing that you'd want to have for your primary connection, unless you're in an area that just doesn't get you know, other types of connections or satellite is too expensive. Uh, but uh, it's certainly uh, an option. It's a great one for a secondary internet in case your primary goes down. There's also cell WAN devices now. So you just pop, pop in a card into a router-like device and then uh, it automatically kicks on when your uh, primary internet goes down. Fiber is converted from light signals to Ethernet. It's the fastest connection over greatest, the greatest distances. It can go miles. Doesn't have interference issues with EMI. Now there's a new type of fiber. It doesn't go as far, but it's a lot cheaper. And that's a PON. And that's the type of fiber that's going to people's homes from various different companies, such as Frontier and, and uh, uh, Comcast is also getting into it as well. So it's called Passive Optical Network. It's not as expensive as active uh, so you could you know easily get gigabit connectivity using a PON type of a fiber network um, without you know paying huge huge amounts of money like you do for active it's just uh, less expensive overall you do have to have various different um, hubs or shacks in the area in order to connect to them because they just don't go that far uh, before they run out of signal so that's why uh, uh, google for instance as they go around and set, uh, set up gigabit ethernet at all these different places um, they are setting up shacks all over the place because this type of fiber doesn't go that far now the active type can go miles and miles and doesn't have EMI interference either, but it can go so much farther than the passive, so that's not required, but uh, the cost of, of using the active is so high that uh, only businesses can really afford it. BPL is broadband over power line. This is a great technology that just has never taken off. Uh, uses the electrical grid to convert signals to Ethernet. It can also travel over miles, uh, maybe even as far as fiber. We don't know yet. Uh, but most rollouts have failed. It never did catch on. So uh, we just haven't been able to get people excited about the electric version of this. So in summary, we talked about uh, switch networks, POTS, Sonnet, Cable, DSL, Satellite, Cell WAN, uh, Fiber, and BPL. So stay tuned for Module 8.